Good evening in Mexico. Good morning in Cambodia. On behalf of La Buena Impresión, ASI, and of the National Authority of Sara for the Conservation of the Region of Angkor, of the National Authority of Preavia, the Royal University of Fine Arts of Cambodia, and the National Institute of Anthropology and History and BBUVA Foundation. Welcome to this first colloquium of Archaeology and Restoration Mexico Cambodia. I and I will be the moderator. Master Fernando Aceves Humana, organizer of this first colloquium, is going to give us some words. Good evening, Fernando. Good evening. It's a very special occasion for me. I want to thank to all the people who have made this possible, the National Authority of Sahara, the National Institute of Anthropology and History, and Chan Sung Keria, who has made all her effort for this colloquium, to all or our organizers, without whose support this wouldn't have been possible. I want to thank Nan Sochet, Director of Academic Affairs of the University of Cambodia. And I also want to talk a little bit about this project that has been possible thanks to the rector of the university and to San Sopiaca also, director of the University of Fine Arts and to the Faculty of Archaeology and Architecture of the University of Cambodia. We are glad to have Guillermo Barrera here with us. Archaeologist Raul Barrera has been in charge of extraordinary monuments whose discovery and research has been very important and some features still continue being a mystery for us to know the people who built those sites. It's very interesting. Thank you very much. The conference of tonight in charge of archaeologist Raúl Barrera is going to be called Experiences of an Archaeologist. Now I'm going to read something about his CV. Throughout his 33 years of professional development, the archaeologist has carried out 53 archaeological interventions in different regions of the Mexican Republic. Some of his most outstanding works are those carried out in the state of Nayarit, where he has conducted research in the archaeological site of Ixtlán del Río, in the Aguamilpa Hydroelectric Dam, and in the El Cajón Hydroelectric Dam Archaeological Salvage Project. Likewise, he has performed archaeological works in Tula Hidalgo, as well as in the city of Tlalpa de Comonfort, Xochipala, and in the archaeological site of Ixcateopan Guerrero. In the state of Oaxaca, he has worked in the Cañada region, in the Mixteca Alta, the coast and the central valleys. In addition, he has collaborated in the excavations carried out in the Pyramid of the Sun as part of the Teotihuacan Special Project. He is currently in charge of the Urban Archaeology Program at the Templo Mayor Museum of the INA. In the later, research focuses on the heart of Mexico City in the perimeter that in pre-Hispanic times comprised the sacred precinct of Tenochtitlan. He has been lecturer in different academic fora in Mexico and the Road. He has 113 scientific and population and dissemination publications and has been curator for 33 national and international exhibitions. In 2004, he was awarded the Nayarit Medal, the highest distinction granted by the third government of Nayarit. He is currently coordinating research work at the sites located at Guatemala Street number 16 and 24, where the temple of Ejecatl Quetzalcoatl and the Way Tumpantli of Tenochtitlan were recently discovered. Welcome, archaeologist Raúl Barrera. Thank you very much. Good evening. I am very glad to be with you here today. 
I think the Colectivo Tequio La Buena Impresión and also to all of you who are here with us tonight, the, the archaeologists, our colleagues, public in general, and all the people interested to know these works that we are carrying out. I would also like to thank Fernando, Fernando Aceves Humana, for the opportunity of being here with you tonight. Fernando and I have been long-time acquaintances and we have worked together. He knows the way some pantley of Tenochtitlan, which is located in the historical center of Mexico City. In this talk that I'm going to give you, I would like to speak about some works that we have carried out here in our country, in Mexico and I will focus on the task performed in archaeological salvage. Let's remember that we have three modalities of archaeological research in Mexico. One is archaeological rescue, the other one is salvage, and specific projects of archaeology. Salvage is related to the works that are undertaken in different places of our country. And I am going to talk to talk about two regions that are very important for me and that somehow identify this salvage task in two different contexts. And I also want to know to those who are not devoted to the archaeology science so that they can know more about this science and how we carry out our works in different cultural and geographical scenarios. So I am going to start with a work performed in the region of Nayarit, which is in the Occident region of Mexico. And later, I will speak about the works we are carrying out in the historic center of Mexico that is also a safeguarding, it's also a salvage work, and I am going to explain how we intervened in these two different regions and what we have done in order to investigate and what we have done to protect the archaeological heritage. Let's start. I'm going to share my screen so that we can start with this presentation. We will start by looking at this image that is the Occidental Mother mountain range in the state of Nayarit. And this is a very rough area where we undertook a sal an archaeological salvage work where it was intended to build a hydroelectrical dam by the National Energy Commission of Mexico and there we worked between 2003 and 2006. And then in this next slide we can locate the region that we are speaking about today and as I already told you, the aim of the presentation is to know the strategies that we have developed in these two projects. These two projects of archaeological salvage in different places, in different times, chronologically speaking of the archaeological contexts of which we are speaking. This is the cultural division of Mexico. It's divided into regions. This is the part known as Mesoamerica, where large civilizations were developed and where large cities or urban centers were built. And where different groups went along together. So these are the different regions in which the country has been divided. And we are 
focusing on the occident part of Mexico. Here in the upper part, we can see that the state of Nayarit and we can see the different areas on the mountain range. That is a place where we can find the ethnic groups known today as Coras and we also can find Huicholes. There is the plateau of Nayarit where we can find different archaeological remains like tombs, tombs here we worked between 2003 and 2006. Here we started developing the first research, the investigation. We located the archaeological sites. And as you can see, the topography and the rough surface made a little difficult to establish large settlements or cities or towns. And the population centers were located in places away from this part. We were working in the margins of the Rio Grande de Santiago River, which is a large river that is born in the central part of Mexico near the Nevado de Toluca volcano, and it runs up to crossing the state of Nayarit. In this area where it was intended to build a dam, using an area of around 65,000 meters, we started investigating all around the surface. We camped in some of the places and we began making a survey and the initial register of these archaeological remains that date from different times. Some are 2000 years old, corresponding to the groups that developed there. And then there are other chronological occupations, occupations corresponding to different chronological stages. And this is very interesting to find these vestiges in such a beautiful landscape where we needed to adapt to the conditions of the soil and of the geography. Here we can see the Santiago River bed, which is a sacred river as we are going to see. The indigenous groups, Coras and Huicholes, considered this river as a sacred one. And these were some of the conditions that we faced when we first arrived with the group of the archaeological salvage group. And there we worked for four years. Sometimes we did all the tours around the site on foot. As you can see, this is a very uneven land and it was a little difficult to visit the place in another manner than with animals. So we had to reach all the sites and it was a little complicated. And then our aim was to identify and start protecting, protecting all the archaeological vestiges. One of the most important remains that we found is a site with different shaft tombs, which was very interesting. That is the area where there was a cemetery where all the deceased were deposited 2000 years ago. And this is a place, an ex exclusive site for burials. And this place is next to the river, to the sacred river. And according to the world view of indigenous groups, these holy rivers or sacred rivers were related to the death. For the Nahua peoples, this would be the underworld and the path to where the deceased go to have their eternal rest. 
these rivers are also re depicted or they are associated to snakes given the shape of the river and that is also part of the world view here we find different shafts with tombs these are called tomb shafts these are holes on the ground that can be around 90 centimeters wide those are vertical shafts and on the bottom there is an access to a vault a vault that can be three to four meters wide and there the bodies the corpses were buried accompanied by different objects that were supposed to accompany the deceased to their eternal voyage some of the tombs have been looted and some others were found intact 12 of them have not been looted and they still had the dead bodies surrounded by other objects that are depictions of pregnant women of warriors and utilitary uses of domestic use and other objects that are closely related to the symbolism. Let's remember that in pre-Hispanic times, people believed in the afterlife and they knew or they believed that life was didn't end in this life, so they just entered in another transit to go to another level. And that was the objective of placing those objects to accompany the death on their way to a new essence or to a new level of life. This is another example of the offerings found in the tombs. When we found this tomb, it was intact and there we could see the bodies and all the offerings around. Here we can see the bones, the skulls of the seven persons who were buried there, some of them children, they had shell objects and some magnificent clay sculptures of pregnant women and important women and different objects such as small figurines of warriors and other objects. This is another site that we could register but unfortunately, we couldn't make any digging as we would like because of the circumstances that I already told you, that is the uh, geographical conditions, there is practically no access. And the unique way to arrive there is walking for many hours or even days in order to reach those sites. We needed to camp to stay living there for some time and then leave again so it was very difficult to access there and therefore we couldn't have the chance to dig that site but we could register and protect it we could excavate one of the shaft tombs and here we can see some of the objects dating from 2000 years ago some of them are wait they're polychrome they have different colors different motifs different designs geometrical designs asymmetric designs and we can see that they have a, a very important and astonishing images and symbolism we have plates we have pots phytomorphic and anthropomorphic pots and jars. And this is a little example of what we found there. These figurines found in the shaft tombs that were extracted after the excavation, these are depictions of naked women. They have a very interesting decoration and also the form and the expression. Some of them are carrying objects. They, some of them have a baby. They are carrying their 
babies on the back. And these images have a, a great symbolism. Some of them are decorated with different motifs. In the back side of the head, they, the figurines have a hole. In, in a sort of way, these are recipients. It is believed that in some rituals in pre-Hispanic times, liquids were poured into those figurines or vessels. And for example, in this one, you can appreciate in the face of the woman that there is a lot of expression. And it has remains of painting resembling like tears and the hands on the belly, which are very expressive. And we can see there that the figurine has a modeled skull or a sort of deformation. There are some other representations of objects that accompanied those death found in the shaft tombs, in the place, in the site known as La Playa, next to the river, in the heart of the mountain range. All these groups who made those burials didn't live there. They probably lived in very far places, but as that place was a sacred land, they went there maybe walking many kilometers in order to reach that point and bury their deceased in that sacred place. All this scenario, we can say, all that accompanied those deaths, as could be the warriors or the women, the depictions, there were also found sculptures of musicians, of ball players. There is a depiction of a musician playing a drum. That other one has another instrument that could be something in Spanish called guiro. Some of them have a leporine lip or a cut on the upper part of the lip that probably could be intentional. There are the ball players. That one is probably is drinking something, probably a tejuino, which was a religious drink. There are representations of birds. Those are guacamayas. Tlacuaches, there are, and that is a pregnant tlacuache. And those are representations of the daily life. And there we can appreciate all the decoration present on the body and on the face. Some of them are carrying weapons. And we can see the decoration, the, the decoration on the nose and on the ears made of shell. And those are the representations of the warriors. Those warriors accompany the death on their way to the new life. We can also see the attire of those warriors, which is something very interesting. In this area, at present time, we still find indigenous groups. There are some places that we excavated and we thought that were remains of past civilizations, but we realized that no, they were remains from present civilizations, that is to say, of life indigenous groups. And there we can see that in the region we can still find living groups, and we still find indigenous groups living there who still preserve some of the traditions of the past. We also had a chance to make the research of these groups in order to understand the archaeological remains. 
in some regions of our country, in fact, in many regions, we can still find that as Mexico is a multi diverse country in terms of culture. And there are still many groups with different world views that come from the pre Hispanic times and are still maintained. This is a place known as the Santa Teresa del Nayar on the upper part of the mountain range in the state of Nayarit. And we had the chance to attend a celebration that is called Judea, which is the representation of modern day warriors that are painting themselves and they say they are erasing themselves with that painting so that way they stop being humans and become stars they are warriors becoming stars in a cosmic war that is being developed in that ceremony of the judea that is developed during the holy week in the months of march and april and Something very interesting is that the body painting is closely related to the tradition of the shaft tombs that were found, to the figurines. We can see the same elements, the same decoration, the same colors, and the same attire as we could see in the clay figurines of the warriors found in the shaft tombs. Therefore, we can say that this tradition celebrated by indigenous and non-indigenous groups, that tradition has been kept along the time and is still alive. These warriors are warriors representing the stars according to the Gora worldview. And this is a cosmic war that is developed during the Judea and they are trying to kill the sun. That is also related to the Catholic region because the Koras acquired elements, they adopted elements from the Catholic religion and adapted them to their worldview. So these warriors are painted with lime. That's the white color of the lime, it's the color, and they have some black circles. Those black circles identify them as warriors of the cosmic war. That celebration was known as the Mitote Cora in pre-Hispanic times. This has not disappeared, but only has been transformed along the time. We propose that these warriors are the heritage or the evolution of those ancient warriors depicted in the shaft tombs. And this same thing occurred in the Templo Mayor where similar ceremonies were performed. There were also representations of holy wars where the warriors exercised. As the Tosca feast where Pedro del Varado killed many people there in the Templo Mayor, and it was the representation of the holy wars that were developed and that were dedicated to their gods. Maybe it's not identical, but the concept is the same, and the purpose and the aim of these celebrations was the same. This is what we find in the heart of the Sierra Madre Occidental, where the Coras live, and there they, there they make exercise. They exercise and they fight, and they have their weapons, the same weapons that we found in the shaft tombs, We know that the Coras, even in the 19th century, they, they used shaft tombs. These have been forbidden now, but in the 19th century, they still buried their dead in shaft tombs. And this is the ceremony. You can see the children with their buttons and their musical instruments. And I've been there for a long time to document this festivity of the Judea Cora of Santa Teresa del Nayar. And here we have had the chance of being there. These rituals are very complex. 
but little by little we are we have been registering this and we still need to continue with this register and this was the first part of the presentation in order to explain the salvage works in archaeology that is what i am more focused in we work in infrastructures works where dams are being built or roads and highways and tourist complexes are intended to be built next to archaeological remains and these works have allowed us to propose salvage works and to save and identify different re archaeological research Fernando asked me to share with you part of this experience, especially to youths. And I am sure that different colleagues are watching this presentation. And I also expect that youths who are not part of this archaeology world know about the works that we develop on the urban areas, on the coast and the mountains and everywhere in every place this investigation is interesting and these archaeology works are very interesting and this is some these are some of the examples of what we face with this project now i am going to talk about the urban archaeology program and here we are on the heart of mexico city we worked on the part that comprised the sacred precinct of Tenochtitlan. In this place was located the heart of an empire dominated and conquered around 400 peoples in a century. But upon the arrival of Hernán Cortés and all the thousands of indigenous who were accompanied him, in fact, Cortés what Cortes did was to lead an indigenous revolt because thanks to Cortes, they had the chance to free from the domain of the Mexicas and the triple aliens. And this was in fact a revolt of thousands of indigenous who joined Cortes along his road along his road from Veracruz to Mexico. This is the city of Tenochtitlan, where the ceremonial center is located and where they have their temples for their gods. This is an extremely sacred place. This is the most sacred space of the city, of the Tenochtitlan city. This city was laid, the layout was in four axes, that were roadways. This is the roadway of Iztapalapa. This is the Tlacopan roadway, Tlacopan or Tacuba. And this was the roadway on the road to the Tepeyac and that one to the place of the docks. This was a lake city inside the water. There were five lakes. This is the Texcoco Lake, the biggest. And this was a lake city and it went increasing its urban area by working on architectural projects called chinampas that were like artificial terraces built in the water with the aim of giving some solidity to the ground. And they filled the spaces with soil in order to make the surface bigger. This Chinampas were used to build dwellings, but likewise they were used to raise their crops. There's vegetables, fruits, flowers, and the way of moving, the transportation was made for Chinampas through small boats. There were canoes to move from one place to another and to carry the merchandises. This city had like ended up having 300,000 inhabitants and the soldiers of Cortés mentioned that and all the people accompanied Cortés said 
that this city was even bigger than Venice and other large cities in Europe. These soldiers have been in different wars in Europe and they were surprised by the size of the city. The city has around 80 quarters. There we find the city of Tlatelolco. And now we are going to see the place where we work, which is the precinct of the sacred area, that is the temple area space in charge of Dr. Leonardo Lopez Luján. Our task is the salvage of archaeological remains and we work in the spaces where the temples were located. We are in a totally urban area, which is today's Mexico City, and this is very interesting. This city that is wonderful is also a chaotic city, and it's very difficult. This city was built, and it was very difficult to be supported because it was built over a lake. So now we can see that the city has problems with the levels as, and as the water has been taken out, the water from the subsoil, there are problems with the stability of the buildings. Some buildings are being sinking for many time and that is a challenge to maintain them. And as the more water we take out from the subsoil, the city, the more the city will be under the waters. The archaeological salvage is very important in this case. Here we can see some of the stages of the urban archaeology program. We can see that here many disciplines converge, archaeologists, anthropologists, historians, engineers, and many other disciplines. And thanks to them is that we have achieved to carry out this work. Some of the findings on the foot of the main temple or Templo Mayor was in the access to the temple. Here we find the speech of representation of the Mexica element. And here we can see that we have found lots of snakes and all these elements were depicted in a sort of writing. And therefore this place has been as in and interpreted as a sacred place. It is associated to the place of birth of Huitzilopochtli on the base of the sacred mountain. And this is identified to, and this is linked to human sacrifice and with war and sacrifice and with death. These are representations of war, what we can find here. And these representations are also related to the captives of war, to offerings. And the, our task is also to protect this heritage by, by making research and also protecting all the heritage located in the subsoil of Mexico City. In some special cases, we can exhibit these vestiges so that people can know them because we have understood that we work for the people. We investigate, that is our job, but we also need to give the people their past so that they can know it and enjoy it. Of course, not everything is possible because it's not so easy. We need to pay attention to details as security, safety, to preservation, and sometimes we have reached to have suitable spaces for their exhibition. Here we see remains related to the use of fire. Here we see uh, the remains or the rests of a holy tree, which was protected and now is part of the exhibition. This is the culture center of Spain in Mexico. There we worked in 2007 and eight. And there we found some remains of what we have proposed to be the Calmecac. 
the Calmeca was a college where the children of the noble groups studied. There, the future priests and the future warriors and rulers of the city were educated and prepared. The discipline was very hard. It was like a boarding school where they entered since being children and they were educated, strictly educated. They were taught religious aspects, literature, gastronomy, mathematics, music, and they had a very complete education. The city of Tenochtitlan had lots of schools. There were different schools also located inside the main precinct and outside also. Tenochtitlan was a civilization with a large development. They had a very well-structured city, a government with officers. It was a city with a lot of order, very clean. And here we can see some of the pictures of the gods that were excavated in this place. What is interesting of these gods is that they were found on a well dating from viceregal times, which is after the arrival of the Spaniards. These sculptures were intended to be destroyed. And we believe that the very indigenous people deposited them in those wells in order to protect them from destruction. Other objects like this object, an eagle, some other architectural elements that were architectural details placed on the Calmecac. And it was possible to build the vestiges and now we can exhibit them in an underground museum, which is located on the basement of this building. This an open museum and here we can see some of the objects exhibited and then we are going to see the Ejecatlquetzalcoatl temple there authorities intended to build a parking lot in 2010 and since that year we have been working there until today there, a hotel is being built, but it was very important for us to make the register of all that we found, and we found the temple of Ejecatl Quetzalcoatl, a deity of the wind, and fortunately we have been able to keep to maintain the remains. There is a depiction of how the temple would have looked like. The temple was round and the entrance was with a space resembling the face of a serpent. Here are also found remains of the ball game. There is a model where we can see more or less how the space was organized and how the temple and the ball game would look like. We are making the protection works in order to safeguard these spaces. And we expect that soon can be shown to the public the Tompantli and the temple. The works are still continuing. The city of Mexico is live, it has needs and it is increasingly growing and it must be functional. But we are also very interested in protecting the archaeological heritage. So we work in a coordinated way with engineers, with proprietors of properties, archaeologists and architects, all with the aim of seeking and finding solutions to preserve this heritage. We also need to give solutions to both preserve the heritage and allow the works required by the population. Here we can find a great base of a pyramid. This was found on the Republica de Argentina street. 
and it's been given maintenance. And due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the, some of the works were stopped for some time, but now we are retaking these works in order to soon be able to show them to the public. The remains of this pre-Hispanic base are interesting. And now we are going to see the remains of the Sompantli on the street of Guatemala. And there, the proprietors of the building asked for permission to the INA, to the Anthropology Institute, in order to carry out the works. Because, you know, in Mexico City, we cannot perform any work in these areas without the permission of the INA. So permission must be requested, and we need to evaluate the permissions and try to save as much as we can. Once the permission is granted, the Institute authorizes the interventions, trying to rescue and preserve all the buildings of the different stages, as all of these are heritage. From 2015, we have been in charge of this project. Arch architect, archaeologist Lorena Vasquez and myself. And for a long time, we posed that we would probably find the Sompantli, which was a place where the skull of the sacrificed could be found here. And we did some diggings according to our hypothesis, but we couldn't find it. Almost at the end of the works, when we were coming more to the south of the building, we could finally find hundreds and hundreds of remains of skulls, thousands of pieces of skulls. And we saw all those pieces of skulls associated to the landfill. We said we are now in the place of the way Sompantli, which was the way to say the large Sompantli dedicated to Huitzilopochtli, the main god of the Mexica. There we found the limits of the building. And as we are in an urban area, we just found remains. But something very important is that we could finally find this space. And what called our attention the most was the circular building the Great Sompantli, for those who are looking at us, it was a platform, the Sompantli was, was a space composed by great large shafts, by large poles, and these poles have some other structures and some holes, and through these holes, some sticks were put with groups of five skulls, skulls with orifices made on the temporary bone, and that way all these skulls were shown and were exhibited as an offering to the god Huitzilopochtli, to the warrior god of the Mexica. So this circular building having hundreds of skulls, and there we can see that the skulls are placed like looking at the middle and the bottom of the building. This would be the internal facade of this round tower with all the skulls around it. These are hundreds of skulls. And I would like to tell you that the grand that the Wei Sompantli or Great Sompantli, more than a place of death, is a place of life because that way they renovated life according to their worldview. Human sacrifice performed in these times were sacrifices of warriors, male and female warriors, and probably a 3% of children. Maybe children were representations of gods or deities or divinities. But all of these individuals were finally sacred or holy. This is one of the most sacred spaces of the city because all these 
people were sacrificed, some of them willing to be sacrificed, but others were probably captives who were sacrificed against their will. This is the outer facade. Here you can see the outer facade of the building or a tower or round wall resembling a cylinder. It measures 4.70 4 meters and it was partially destroyed during the conquest. It was destroyed by Cortés who almost destroyed the entire city. And from what they knew in 1519, we only have a small percentage of the buildings. Here we can see the diameter of this circular structure with all the skulls. And we are starting to work on that other part. We have almost finishing the limiting this tower. And probably there were two towers, not only one. One of the soldiers of Cortés, Hernando Tapia, describes the ways on Pantli and mentioned that there were like two. And he said they were like the walls of the building. And on each side, it had a, a tower made with skulls. So there were two. It must have been astonishing for them to find these skulls this structure with skulls and these towers with skulls also represented a message to all the subdued people by the Mexica. Here we can see that we had to establish a provisional camp in order to carry out these works, very hard works. And that I believe that all the colleagues who worked here put all their effort I cannot mention all of them who worked in this, but this is this work is the result of all the effort as well as of the proprietors of the buildings around this, because they allowed us to make the intervention and the research. They are obliged by law to allow us, but they have also cooperated in order to achieve this. The skulls have been studied and as you can imagine, this is a world of information what we, that we found here. And this is a reconstruction of what the weight and Pantley must have been according to data that we have gathered. This is a hypothetical reconstruction, but this is what it would have looked like. Those are the wooden poles with the skulls of the sacrificed and of course that Mexicas didn't sacrifice just as any simple person. They sacrificed the women, died during childbirth, they sacrificed the warriors, and women who died in childbirth were considered warriors, so they were also placed there. Their skulls were there. Also female warriors remains or skulls, but they were not just simple people, they were considered warriors. We also have information that women also went to war, there were female warriors. And therefore the skulls were deposited in those circular round towers, which is not a, a practice that was exclusive for the Mexica, it was seen in other places in America in different regions and cultures along Mexico. We find them in the Occident part, in the center of Mexico, and even in the Maya area. And it's possible that many of those civilizations had these round towers with the Zampantlis. So this is a reconstruction that we are carrying out as I tell you, it's hypothetical and we are constantly making changes. 
And as the investigation works advance, they will surely have more changes. This is what we have from the sacred precinct that is being worked. And there is the Mayor Temple, the Calmecac. And other temples, there is the Sompantli, the Bull Game, and the Wind of the, and the um, Temple of the God of Wind, the Hecatl. And that is what we have up to date. This will be enriched a long time with more research. And it has been a pleasure to be here with you. I thank very much to the collective Tequio La Buena Impresión, to our colleagues from Cambodia, to the public in general that is watching us in Cambodia and Mexico. And I especially thank Fernando Aceves for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Fernando asked me to talk about my trajectory and I said, okay, I would like to talk to you about different places, but for me, this is the most significant, this is the most important, and this is the most important that has to do with the core of archaeologists, and this is very important, at least for me, and I am very interested that youths who are watching us tonight can have this information and that it can be useful for them. Everybody knows what they want to develop, but I wanted to show it, to show you and present you what we do in archaeology. And we have a great passion for our work. I liked archaeology since I was small. I have always liked it and I have enjoyed this work very much, the work related to the past. And also to see the richness of our country, same as Cambodia, I, know, I don't know Cambodia, I have not been there, but I know very well about the cultural richness Cambodia has. And this was the aim of our presentation, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now we are continuing with the second part of this presentation, which is the session of questions and answers. I would like to ask Fernando if he can make some comments about what archaeologist Barrera presented. This was very nice. I would like to have questions from the public. I only want to thank for this opportunity to have or to establish a collaboration with the people of the INA to share this. I want to thank Mariela Contreras, Maria de la Paz, Luis Alberto and Leonardo Perras who have been working us on behalf of La Buena Impresión, to Ulises Leiva, director, media director of the INA, and TV INA, to the director of TV INA, who have made possible that knowledge of this, the knowledge of these archaeologists can be disseminated and to be accessible for youths. There are three comments. The Dr. Keri Asun, who is our right hand in Cambodia and has made a great effort in order to have to bring together all the archaeologists from Cambodia in this colloquium. We have comments about the interesting presentation. Architect Gerardo Ramirez also made comments about the digging in the lake areas, such as where the Templo Mayor is located. And he made comments about the effects of water in these archaeological remains. And this is, for example, a similarity between 
the center of Mexico and other archaeological sites in Cambodia. If we remember yesterday's presentation, we can remember how water can be an ally or an enemy of restoration. In this sense, yesterday's and today's talks are very clear when speaking about making archaeology related to places where there is plenty of water. I have a question for Raúl, for archaeologist Raúl Barrera. We are speaking about the different projects and you mentioned how you got interested since you were a kid in archaeology and I would like to ask you if you remember which was the first site that you visited and when you decided this is what I want to do. I am originally from a town in the northern region of the state of Guerrero. The town is called Ixcateopan de Cuauhtémoc. This is a small town, which is part of a mountain that's a mountainous area. And the interest for archaeology arose since I was a small kid. I met, I knew the field with my family. My family who were people from the field. And they taught me, the people and my parents taught me to appreciate that. I also worked in the field in the crops since I was a kid. And it was very interesting for me to see all the remains on the hills, on the field, to see small figurines, to see all the fragments or remains of walls. And I think that I received that education. Our parents and our ancestors always prepare us and educate educate us, although we don't notice that. And that way I found the interest in archaeology and I always wanted to study archaeology. This is not an easy career and it's not easy to achieve it. We have to face many limitations and make great efforts, but finally we do what we like. And what I receive the more is the satisfaction. And I also like to give to the people what is of them. This is for all of us. And I have enjoyed living this moment. All archaeologists know that the encounter with the past is something incredible. There are some things that we know through documents, but when we dig and find them, the contact with the remains, the encounter is shocking sometimes. For example, in the case of the Tompantli or the shaft tombs. So I just wanted to show you what the salvage works are. One, dating from 2000 years ago and another from 500 years ago. And I do that with great joy. And I liked very much the city of Mexico. This has been a very interesting experience to work in urban areas. This is a very complicated area because we have to deal with different aspects. The fragility of the soil, the terrain is not solid. Different actors converge in these works and all of them have opinions, but we need to find that harmony with the past. And the, I want to tell you that the past can go along with the present, it's possible. We just need to join efforts. If we look at the trajectory of archeologist Barrera from the field to the city, he had the chance to make 
excavations in his original land. Not all archaeologists have been able to do that and then to move and make large research in the city of Mexico. In the place where he did archaeological digging, also other important archaeologists have worked. And that after those works, the project of urban archaeology, the urban archaeology program was born in Mexico. And after that, they have been working in many places, knowing how to take that responsibility and take that program to many places in the country. Dr. Kerry Asun, who is here with us from Cambodia, she would like to know if you can explain to the people of Cambodia which was the importance of the ball game in pre-Hispanic Mexico. You introduced the remains that found that were found through this program, but what was the importance, the religious importance and even political of the ball game? The ball game had different meanings. It was a ritual game related to the fight between the sun and the moon and the stars. It's also related to fertility and agriculture. And the ball game is going to be found always in sacred spaces. It's associated to temples and sacred spaces or sacred towns and cities. The players were considered warriors, also astral warriors, and there were winners and losers, and there was also, after that, human sacrifice. It's not known exactly, but it it supposed that losers were sacrificed and other proposals say that the winners were those who were sacrificed. But anyway, we still believe that probably the losers were the sacrificed ones. And this also has to deal with beliefs and this closely related to fertility. And warriors, or warriors intervene in ball game, and there are many theories and ideas about the ball game. Maybe some of these individuals who were sacrificed in the ball game, it's possible that their skulls were placed later in the Sampantli. The Mexica was a people that mainly lived from war. They conquered in order to receive tributes and they were prone to to war. And this ball game also had to do with their beliefs. And they believed that the Sampantli was important. It's important to understand their worldview and to know that indigenous groups still believe that the afterlife is another life, is a new life after the death. And that is part of the worldview today. And the Sampantli is a temple. It's a temple of life. And by making those sacrifices, they ensured the existence of universe and of life and the afterlife. And it was made in reciprocity with the gods. There was a reciprocity between God, gods and men, and they offered sacrifices in, non, in order to ensure the continuity of life. They wanted to ensure that their gods would still bring benefits to them. And the urban archaeology program I am in charge of and in which I have worked for many years with Professor Eduardo Matos Moctezuma. I am very thankful with him for this opportunity and for all that he has taught to me 
all that we do is all that he has given to us and what he has taught to us. And I believe that that's the reason why we are making all this work, because he is our guide in this sense and guides us to protect these remains and helps us to find all the mechanisms in order to be able to show when to exhibit these remains. This has been very interesting. I've learned a lot from him and from also other, from other regions and other people. Thank you very much. Let's also remember that there is a, a very important publication, which is the doctor thesis of a researcher who was engaged in the French archaeological mission in the 60s of the 20th centuries. And that thesis is even found through the internet. There is another comment. Sí, bueno, este, eh, no, nosotros eh, hacemos el trabajo arqueológico. We make the archaeological works. There are no ceremonies. But it is very important to preserve those skulls. For us, it is very important because they were human beings. And our responsibility besides investigated them because we are making, we are performing genetic research and genetic examinations and there is much to do. And it's a work that will take us a long time, but these skulls are intended to be protected and that will take some time. In that space, besides the Sampantli, we are going to evaluate the exhibition of the skulls. We first need to preserve them because those are organic materials, but we don't want to deplete the information. We want to protect it to have it available for future projects with different techniques and technology. We are just going to take samples for our research to continue working, but we want to ensure that these skulls are going to be protected and preserved for the future. Master Fernando Aceves. Because I knew areas where there were killings and the skulls were exposed in the way of the Sompantli and there is a close similitude. And when Raul Barrera 
gave me permission to paint inside the Sumpantli, the question I made myself was which landscapes they saw, what were they angry at, what did they love, and I felt like a desire of narrating their lives. And the same happened in Cambodia. Something I like very much from the culture of Cambodia and we could see in yesterday's presentation is that they always ask for permission to the place and to the spirits eh, that inhabit there. That's all. Session. We want to remind you that next session and we wait for you on the next session. Uh, the following presentation will be in charge of Dr. Edarit. Dr. Edarit from the monument area of Angkor. So the invitation is open for all of you to follow this first colloquium of archaeology and conservation in Me Mexico, Cambodia through INA TV, through YouTube of La Buena Impresión. And more details, please, in the Facebook page of La Buena Impresión. Thank you very much for your attendance. And we invite you to follow our program. Goodbye.